this is webinar is being hosted by Blackmore Connects, the ultimate platform uh, for executives wanting to get in private equity. It's also being hosted by Blackmore Partners, Inc., which is the deal side, independent sponsors and investors. Our mission is to find and work with executives who want to land private equity roles. Now, we do have specific criteria I'd like to go over. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the purple squirrel. If you've been on our calls before, you know what the purple squirrel is. But let me tell you what kind of executives we're looking for. Blackmore Partners and Blackmore Partners, uh, Blackmore Connects, we're looking for execs who have industry and or niche expertise. And you can articulate that. You have uh, a track record of building revenue and EBITDA in any cycle a P&L history of at least 50 million, a verifiable track record. We're looking for those who are tired of being wage slave. And what, what I mean by that is you've made a lot of money for other people, but if you look at that money and you look at the bonuses you've gotten, the salary, you've really not gotten but a, a barely a sliver of what that value creation is. We're looking for executives who want their due and are willing to, if you will, run a marathon at a sprint pace. That's what it's like in private equity. We're looking for execs who are tired of just having a good lifestyle. And no equity is the way to go. You have a long-term value creation mindset. And it'll be interesting as I go through these, you know, uh, Chip, as uh, we come to you, and I do have you uh, on mute, and I'll take you off as we get started, on... Uh, what your criteria is when you work with backable execs. We're looking for a value creation mindset. We hope to define that here today. That you're determined to get into private equity because of the freedom to create value and you get paid upside via equity. Some of the questions that we'll discuss, and not all of them, uh, we'll talk about the role of PE, and in this case, uh, Chip Weinberg's uh, family office. What he'll, uh, we'll talk about what kind of a PE firm or family office Chip is compared to, or Weinberg Capital is compared, uh, compared to others and what it is not, what they're investing in and what not and why. Um, in some of the other webinars, uh, we talk about where to find PE firms. And by the way, if you want to find hundreds and hundreds of private equity firms, the best thing to do is get to conferences like Blackmore Con uh, Connects or ACG. Two different types of conferences, but private equity firms are still there, okay? Um, we'll talk a little bit in, in this uh, pre-portion of why reaching out to 200 emails via uh, 200 PE firms is the way to go to get the attention of private equity, to get to the tipping point, to get to the momentum, which is critical, and why it's critical to start building your connections with PE firms now, and a little bit about the email language. And we'll talk with Chip about that, how, what kind of emails get his attention? And we'll see if we agree on that and um, how to find PE firms that are a match to your outcomes or better said, black uh, to your deal expertise, your niche expertise, your background, okay? So let's go on to the type of PE firms that Blackmore is bringing to the table or Blackmore Connects. We're typically working with private equities firms that are uh, investing in 3 million to 50 million EBITDA. They're looking for niches. They're looking for execs, number one, with a deal and or a deal thesis. A deal thesis gets the conversation going, okay? Do you always have to have a deal? No. If you don't know how to find deals, uh, get to us at Blackmore Connects, and um, we'll help you do that. Here's some do's and don'ts in dealing with private equity firms. Again, remember this, Chip. We'd love your feedback. What works for you doesn't work for you today. Do not reach out to a PE firm with a resume. Why? Private equity firms are in the business of doing deals. If you get lucky to hit your resume at the exact same time, they're looking for a replacement exec or they're doing a deal and they need expertise, you're very lucky. But these, exec, these private equity firms are seeing 
hundreds and hundreds of of emails every day. And when you just send a resume and tell them how great you're going to be, they don't have time for it. They're busy going, how do I put capital to work? Or they're busy dealing with issues in their portfolio companies and growing or moving towards an exit. So a resume is not going to do it. What we want you to reach out with is a bio or a deal thesis. Now, what is a deal thesis? To Blackmore, a deal thesis is your ability to articulate trends. And given those trends, how will you take advantage of those trends by doing an acquisition in the three plus million EBITDA? No startups. Okay. So a deal thesis is your calling card. Okay. So what do you write to get a uh, private equity interest if you have a deal thesis is right here. You know, I'm actively talking to proprietary targets. You want to, they want M&A minded executives. They are looking for proprietary targets. And this is a typical uh, email. What to say when you're on the phone? You want to be able to articulate or, you know, in your email, what kind of industry, uh, EBITDA, that you have a thesis, uh, and you want only a 15 or 20 minute meeting. Anything longer than a 15 or 20 media, minute meeting by phone is too much time for a private equity firm unless you have an actionable deal, which, you know, 99.9% .9 of the executives don't at the time they start this process. <clears throat> so what do you want to do? Do you want to take four hours a week for six months emailing hundreds of firms? Or do you want to, if you will, build out a list of PE firms that are exact match to your background? And how do you do that? Through PitchBook through Prequin and through Bloomberg for private equity. Those are the three best databases that you can get in the market. I highly recommend that you find some way to get access to those databases, uh, either through Blackmore Connects, which is free, or through someone you know and do the research to match your background. The better you find private equity firms that are investing directly in areas that are of, of interest to you and or better yet, fit your background. The moment you have a phone call and are sending them an email, uh, leaving them a phone message, the better you're gonna do, okay? So what are the five ways we call this, the uh, 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 pathways to get into a, Land a PE role in 90 to 120, we say now 90 to 180 days, is a deal with a deal thesis. That is, and it fits the private equity firm that you're talking to. That's number one. The purple squirrel is the way to differentiate yourself versus a guy with a resume is you do a deal thesis tailored specifically to your expertise, knowledge, industry expertise, and you ask for a 15 minute phone call okay? to 200 PE firms that's real key. Why 200? It takes critical mass to hit the right time. You can wait for recruiters calls. Don't recommend it. We're finding less than 10% of private equity firms are doing um, investments or using investing in a recruiters right now. Less than 10%. What they're doing is they're building benches right now. And what I mean by building benches is folks like Chip are going to conferences like Blackmore Connects and they're meeting executives that are in their area of investment and they're working with these executives on deal flow that's coming in or these execs, they're considering them for replacement executives or they're considering these executives for board members. But recruiters are not your best bet, although you want to invest in them anyway. You can hire your own personal recruiter. Those uh, recruiters are going for ten to fifteen thousand a month. Expect to uh, spend around seventy-five thousand, worth every penny. Um, the good ones, you're definitely going to land, uh, land rolls. The next area for the in-person, nothing can take place of going to events like ACG uh, or Blackmore Connects. And uh, Chip will talk about his experience of being at both and what it's like. And 
make his recommendation. I personally go to 12 ACG events a year. Uh, just to give you a sense, there's typically uh, anywhere from, depending on the size, 50 to 200 private equity firms and about 1,000 vendors and in a one-day event. Um, it's certainly uh, a challenge to get to these private equity firms, but at least you can uh, collect cards and you can shake their hands. Blackmore connects. Everything's one-on-one. -on -one, everything's set up um, before that. So we're now going to go to Weinberg Capital and introduce Chip Weinberg, uh, one of the managing, uh, one of the leaders of the company, and uh, I believe a co-founder. I'm going to take you off uh, mute here. Let me go to uh, Chip. All righty. Uh, Chip, I want to thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, Weinberg Capital. Weinberg Capital is uh, a partner in the Blackmore Connects events, one of the premier family offices uh, in the market today. Mar uh, uh, Chip is going to define the difference between uh, family offices and other kind of uh, capital partners. Uh, Chip, uh, to get started, how would you describe your firm? Well, uh, thanks, Gerald. I'd just like to say uh, uh, thanks for having me today and uh, look forward to uh, talking to everyone uh, who's on the uh, webinar as well and um, hopefully answering some questions. So I think that the, the best way to introduce Weinberg Capital is uh, we're a family office. And we're based in Cleveland, and we're dedicated to doing uh, direct deal investing. And um, I, I use the word dedicated because yeah, I see us as a, a very good hybrid between a typical PE firm and a family office. And one of the attributes of family offices, a lot of times they are not focused on doing direct deal investing or acquisitions. A lot of times they will be investors in funds of funds or mutual funds and that sort of thing, or even um, more unrelated uh, items like investing in um, venture deals or e even things like theater. Whereas our background and our roots really are in doing direct deal investing in private equity and other classes. And what that, that does is it gives us the professionalism that you would find with a typical PE fund, um, but uh, also the same focus. And then at the same time, I think we have, as a family office, some of the positive hallmarks of that class of investor, which are a what I'd like to describe is more of a kinder, gentler approach. We have a little bit of a longer hold period than a typical PE firm might want to exit in uh, five years, whereas we, we could be a seven to 10 year hold. And, and we match up very well with a seller who's a family, an individual, or an entrepreneur versus another PE exit. And, and why is that? Well, th well, that would be because a lot of the uh, times when you're a, a founder of a business, it becomes your baby and you're very proud of it. You might have family members in the company and you want to make sure that the company ends up in good hands. And, uh, you know, we become a good shepherd for its the, the next leg of its journey upward. And to do that, I think it's about creating the framework for protecting the people uh, battling against the image of PE firms sort of selling off assets uh, just to increase the bottom line and um, and, and being flexible uh, with our structure. In terms of uh, what we look at, uh, we tend to be in the lower middle market, kind of three to seven million in EBITDA sweet spot. Um, we'll have, you know, we look nationwide, but tend to try to look at how how easy it is to get somewhere just because you know, when you're managing a small business, you've got to be able to be there. Um, and then we like manufacturing is our home base, uh, but we like consumer and distribution. And then something I can certainly be talking about, we'll open up other areas if we're backing an executive that really knows a sector well. Uh, and so talk about that there. for a moment. But since we're talking to uh, so many executives here on this call, what does it mean backable? What do you look for in the traits? You heard me cover some of the traits we look for in a backable exec. How would you articulate it? Well, there, there's a, a, certainly a lot of different uh, 
features of, of a backable executive, but one of the most important is they have industry knowledge that enables them to take a, a business and look at it with an eye that somebody that wasn't familiar with that sector uh, would see or wouldn't see. So they could look at healthcare as a good example. It's an area where I have not really looked at a healthcare business since the Affordable Care Act. I'm too afraid of the reimbursement risk issue. I don't know it well. And it's harder to sort of get up to speed with something that, that has that many um, sort of legislative items around it. If someone comes to me and says, you know, I've run three healthcare businesses, I know the sector, I understand the regulation, I know how to spot opportunity, then, then there's really something there. I've got a person that can say, here's why this company is good, here's why I can grow it. Whereas if that same deal just came across my desk, I probably would be afraid of it. I, I just wouldn't know what I could be missing, even if it looked like a good company. You talk about that they have to have run. What about COOs or uh, CFOs who uh, have a have a, a CFO slash COO role uh, being backable? Uh, they definitely could be. I mean, obviously, it's different degrees. It depends on what anybody did and what we're looking at. But absolutely, someone that was a CFO and and understands the operations could also uh, spot spot things. And I, I think it's about playing to the strengths of whatever it is you're good at and and to the extent you have knowledge and uh, certainly even more important you have a deal uh, available in front of you that, that's actionable uh, that goes a long way I, I i think another important thing you know attributes i think it's um also being authentic i think if if somebody comes to me and they say hey here's where my skill set is here's what i'm good at here's what i can do uh, here's areas where we should look, and I'm not as strong here. That that tells me that I can trust their uh, uh, their abilities. I mean, they know what they're good at. They know what their strengths are. They're not trying to be something they're not. So I, I can work with all forms of someone in front of me. It's just a matter of identifying how they fit against whatever the target is. If they don't have a deal um, and they have a deal thesis, Tell us about the role a deal thesis plays, and uh, you see many of them because you come to so many Blackmore Connects conferences. Talk about uh, the qualities of a deal thesis, what is contained into them, and how they serve uh, to start the conversation. Yeah, well, well, certainly a, a thesis, uh, you know, starts providing an actionable an actionable strategy around where you can build a, a, a direction that can result in something you can buy. Uh, you know, in my experience, um, as you mentioned, I've been to uh, many of the Blackmore Connects uh, conferences, and I think they've been fantastic for you guys do a, a great job of taking what somebody thinks, either honing it or, or helping, helping executives find actual targets. Or, or working with them to, even if they have a target, maybe maybe uh, attack it in a different way so that it, it becomes more actionable. But but I think when when you have a thesis and a strategy, it gets my attention because it means uh, a, a, among all the emails that I'm getting, resumes as you mentioned or whatever it is, the probabilities that that call could result down the road in an actual company that we own jointly with that executive go up exponentially because you've narrowed your focus. And if the thesis revolves around the expertise of the executive, then everything starts to end up in alignment. Um, you know, a, a, another good example would be even, even for me, let's say I'm, I'm traveling around, I go to some ACG events and I'm meeting with investment bankers and if I if the investment banker says Chip, what are you looking for? And I go, oh, I like you know pretty much anything. I like deals up to this, and you know send me whatever you got. That will usually produce less result than if I tell them I really like niche manufacturing of consumables of three to six million in EBITDA and on the East Coast that's run by a family. You know, you know then they're going to know to put me with an industrial banker. 
you know, they'll know what I'm size range and it gives them information to keep me in mind, which increases my odds. Yeah, that's really great. I think that's very important for the executives here. We're getting inside the uh, mind of private equity and a deal thesis makes you top of mind. It gives uh, the ex, um, PE firm, the family office in this case, something to grab onto and play off of, which uh, is much different than a typical conversation or a lead in that happens day to day. Uh, uh, Chip, uh, I don't know how, um, some private equity firms we talk to get thousands of resumes every year uh, just because of maybe their name is more household or uh, visibility on the web. How many res how many contacts do you get from executives and typically how do they lead off and how do you process that versus someone who sends you a deal angle? And I don't, when I say deal angle, I don't mean an actual deal, but hey, this is where they wanna go. They're looking for backing. What's the difference? Well, all right, so I'll sort of parse the, say there's two questions you asked. The first is, I, I get um, maybe two to four resumes a, a week, probably, from different things. I mean, it can, that's just a generalization. Some weeks it's more, some weeks it's less. If I just get a cold resume and I have no connection with the person, I basically have a file called resumes that I would probably move it over to unless there was something specific about it or they happened to hit at the exact moment when I was looking, doing a search, which is uh, probably unlikely. The second type, which is a little better, is uh, they're leading in because a good friend of mine or somebody I know has given them my name. And as out of respect for that person or friend, I'll look at the resume and, it, and depending on the level of closeness, you know, I might give it, give it a more of a read. Now, if you layered on top of that, that person has a deal or a thesis, then I get really interested because now I'm not just sort of taking the meeting because I want to, as I say a lot, leave a trail of goodwill and, and honor my, my buddy. It's because I'm really interested because there's something, there's something actionable and it, it makes my time um, that's you know valuable getting everything going on. It, it really justifies the use of time there. Um, Backtracking a minute, I, I thought of a story based upon, you know, what an experienced executive uh, could do or in my story case could have done. One, one of the things I do is I, I keep sort of a lesson learned uh, Excel sheet. And one of the deals we did, it was a company called Channel Products that we own that make, uh, makes igniters for outdoor appliances as well as printed circuit boards. When, when we walked the floor when we were in diligence, you know, that everything looked like it was in order. I mean, it was, you know, the machinery was working, it looked good. Uh, we had a pretty good understanding of the flow and, and, and we ended up closing on the deal. What we found out later on is that the particular model of uh, through hole um, mounting for the printed circuit boards was older technology and the machinery uh, was not updated. Now, somebody that knew that industry, if they had been an exec I was backing, would have spotted that in about 10 seconds because they would have been familiar with the equipment and they would have been able to give us a heads up that we needed to add working capital or CapEx into the budget so that we can avoid uh, going into the deal uh, with, that, with that issue. Maybe we would have had a purchase price adjustment. I don't know. But it's just a real world example that if I had backed somebody, you know, the value they could have brought just from their experience. And that could have been, a CFO could have potentially spotted that just as well as the, the CEO as well. Yeah, especially uh, in the smaller end. And uh, so let's, uh, you talk about um, value creation, but I just lost the question. So let's uh, digress from this. We'll come back to deal thesis, getting the attention of firms like yours. And let's talk about how your firm was founded, uh, Chip. I always think of you because you're the first person I met years and years ago. Uh, but uh, I think uh, your fan, your, your this company goes way back. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yes, certainly. Um, so the, the Weinberg Capital, uh, as, as a family business, was founded by my father going back into the late 70s. 
he was an LBO guy, uh, first person from our family to actually go to college. So it's not like the Weinberg family spans dynasties that were, you know, was passed on through the generations. Uh, he, he was able to um, learn how to buy a small business himself, and then he would run it. This is back before private equity was a term even. And so he would run it, and then, you know, several years later, he'd sell it and buy a little bit of a bigger one. And eventually that led to the uh, mid-80s when he bought probably the most referenceable success, which is the first leg of a company called Hawk Corporation. And Hawk manufactured brake and clutch friction materials for ag, aerospace, racing, uh, really non, non-automotive stuff. You could put truck um, and miscellaneous industrial, so they would supply Caterpillar, uh, aircraft braking systems, Harnish Fager, uh, NASCAR teams. And you know, it, was a, it, was a very, it was a proprietary technology-based company with, with good margins. And uh, what Ron, my father, started to do is uh, add on acquisitions. And while a lot of his peers were building funds, he was growing this company. Uh, I joined with him um, in the mid-'90s. Uh, and after starting over in one of the facilities, <clears throat> I headed up the corporate development, and together we we bought some more companies and then went public um, in the late 90s. And then if you sort of follow time forward, we kept doing add-ons. Um, I set up a plant in China to help grow the business. And uh, eventually it came full circle where Hawk had to digest all the different acquisitions and I left to restart Weinberg Capital outside of Hawk Corporation. And the idea was, as I said in my intro, to partner with uh, individuals or families uh, trying to help them professionalize their business with uh, best practices and, and uh, you know, take their business to the next level, as, as they say. So let's, let, this brings me to a few different questions. You know, what's, what's different when your father started in private equity now, so that's one of the questions I want to I want to get into. Um, you know, can can someone just buy a small business and and get into uh, uh, do private equity deals? What's the what's going on with valuation, and how does that tie in to executives being more important than ever? Okay, well, s- certainly the. Uh I mean, you could call it an asset class, really, of private equity has come a long way since my father's days. I mean, you know, in many ways, I'm sort of envious of the old stories he tells where you could walk around your country club and people would have companies to sell. Uh, <laughs> those days are, are, are long gone. Um, and, and it's because of the success of the asset class. You know, if you sort of follow it forward, basically, once the class started to mature, you had... Uh, private equity funds started to come into the mix. So pension funds and insurance companies started deploying capital into the sector. And then the first, so the first generations of funds came out and, you know, things were uh, still fairly easy to find back in the, you know, we'll say the nineties. And then a lot of the executives of those first funds left off and started starting other ones. And if you keep following forward today, you really have a, a a mature asset class going all the way down to probably about 2 million and EBITDA, maybe even lower in some cases because people are doing add-ons. So you've, you've got a market where everybody's out there looking for deals and it, it's not easy anymore. So to answer your question, the, the uh, benefit of what Blackmore offers is a way to uh, for for a group like me or a private equity firm to get proprietary deal flow uh, coming along with somebody that knows the sector and increases your odds of having a good outcome, um, you know, because one of the other things that can happen these days is sure I could I could go uh, buy a company and overpay for it because it's in an auction, uh, but then if things don't go well. I end up uh, not making money on the investment. You, know, you you don't usually make money on the buy, you make it on the sell. Um, and then the other thing, if you're an executive running that company, you're certainly not going to make your upside and you're still a, a, a wage slave in effect. And this ties into what's the value of the executive in today's market. 
So the, the way we look at it, uh, Chip, is the market is either fully valued or um, overvalued. And without you, the executive, applying your expertise, getting the attention of these private equity firms, the private equity firms are, in a sense, doing their best to not fly blind. They need river guides. And one of the things you brought up with is proprietary deal flow. So most executives we talk to, their first thing is saying, I don't know of any deals. Well, you know, the thing I want to say to those of you uh, who are executives, yes, in the old days, you could probably be like uh, Ron Sr. And uh, there were deals at the country club. You know, they're just waiting. Nowadays, Private equity firms are looking for executives who are attempting, uh, talking, working to identify companies that match a thesis and then start networking with those people. And why? Well, in this market, not only are private equity firms, when they buy a company, they're also doing add-ons. So as you get to know a market in your area of expertise and you're networking and mapping that market, getting to know owners, how valuable does that make that executive uh, uh, chip? Well, it's, it's it's extremely valuable. I mean, as 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 you just mentioned, the uh, days of the country club are over, and it is an overvalued or fully valued market. So, um, you know, that's it's it's uh, why I go to the conferences. It's a it's a very very different uh, type of venue than, than anything else out there. So uh, why we're on um, about finding deals, I'm going to ask you about how you find deals. But what we do with executives who are coming to the conferences and working on our backable exec process is we have one of the biggest owner databases around that we subscribe to. What we do is we forget from the executives the NAICS codes associated with their industry expertise, and we start building out Excel spreadsheets, get the phone numbers, get the emails, get the website, so that executive can quickly scan those companies and weed out the ones that are not. And then we have templates and tools for reaching out to those owners to start the conversation, to warm up things, because when you go to work on a deal with uh, Chip's uh, firm. And uh, Chip, what percentage of the deals do you see that are investment bank versus proprietary? Well, um, <laughs> gosh, uh, proprietary deals are a very small percentage. I mean, let's say, I mean, out of 100, maybe I see uh, four proprietary, but two I'm not interested in. Got it. So, and the rest are, so we'll just say 95% uh, of your deal flow is investment bank. And you may get deal flow that you just pass on because you don't have the expertise. So one of the benefits for you getting on this call, getting started, getting your deal thesis, letting Blackmore help you build out a funnel and demonstrating your M&A minded, it increases the interest level of folks like Chip, their firms bringing deal flow that is a match for your deal thesis or adjacent because you will stick in the mind. So you're not just doing it all your own. What are your thoughts about that um, comment, Chip? I, I think that makes perfect sense. I, I would agree with it. And by the way, as we're continuing here, I want to remind everyone there's a question section. Uh, please go ahead and start um, writing down your questions so that we have them. And by the way, uh, Chip, you I'm still on the biography page. Do you want to continue to discuss anything else on yeah, the biography? Yeah, you, you want to go to the next one on uh, what makes us different, I think. Um, Investment criteria? Uh, let's see. Is there anything there? No, I okay. think I, I think got that. Yeah, that that's good. I think um, let me just look for I miss missed anything here. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll bring up a, a couple things at the bottom. One of one of the things I like to talk about, which I think is important for you know, I like this to tell this to the executives at the uh, conferences as well. I think core values for us are very important. 
you know, if you see in the, the bottom, we have these six core values we implement at all our portfolio companies. But the first one, integrity, and we also apply that to the executives that we work with in the sense that I really try to make working with executives a uh, an enjoyable and uh, stress-free process in the sense that if you do work with us, and I meet you at the Blackmore Conference, um, you know, one of the things we do is we, we really uh, like working with folks with experience like that. So we are all about making sure what Gerald says happens, that at the end of the day, um, you have equity that um, when there's a successful exit, you know, you realize the uh, fruits of your labor, labor in a um, in a manner that you haven't achieved ever before, um, and then in these other these other core values we believe are helpful also to uh, let sellers know they're going to end up in in good hands. Um, and then I, I guess the other thing is, uh, as a family office, it's important to know that we're all putting our capital at risk here. Uh, which sometimes is very different than a PE firm. So it's not just the Weinberg family, other people, my other partners, we're all personally investing. So we really are truly partners with anybody that we're joining forces with to go uh, buy and run a business. Um, anyway, that's, that's uh, what I wanted to say, Gerald. So. Okay, great. Let me, uh, one of the questions that uh, just came up, uh, so, uh, we have an executive, Bruce, uh, he's asking, where would you go if your experience is in the lower, I would call it lower, lower, uh, market building companies from 500 K up to, uh, uh, 3 million EBITDA mark, uh, Bruce, uh, that is actually a burgeoning category for, uh, private equity firms. It's a very unique type of family offices and private equity firms. They tend to be very operationally oriented. And uh, the only way to uh, find those uh, folks is by luck. Or um, I recommend that you get a hold of the Blackmore Connects group and uh, join. And you can get access to PitchBook. Or if you have access to PitchBook somewhere else, by the way, uh, PitchBook is about 40 grand a year uh, for, the, uh, for the license. Uh, there's also Prequin 33,000 uh, and Bloomberg Terminal for private equity, which is about 29,000. A pitch book is the best. So that's a burgeoning market, and uh, you would have to get the Blackmore Connects to build out a list of PE firms uh, in that market. Not only what you would want to do is you'd want to specify what industries and other factors the Blackmore Connects can do yeah. it, but that's all part of being members. Do you have any other way that uh, people can find the 500K to 3 yeah. million EBTA? Uh, uh, go ahead, Chip. Yeah, yeah, I've got some. some are, you, are you talking about finding it or finding a partner for it? Finding I guess, partners right? that do that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's there's two thoughts. One is, and this is my personal answer, if there's something smaller, I mean, I guess you get down to 500, that's getting a little low, but let's say you're uh, maybe one five to three, there's certain industries that have gotten so overheated that will go down farther for platforms if it, if the company can pass the screening tests of a, of a standalone uh, and those would be things like aerospace or food and uh, food uh, or two sectors and even to some degree measurement and testing can fall into that sector Absolutely. whereas you get you get up to about three and your multiple is going to go through the roof um, and when you and, say through the roof, what do you mean? Fifteen? I just we just saw a three main uh, test uh, food testing uh, went for fifteen times. Three main they've done. Yeah, yeah. So it makes sense sometimes to to go small. And then and then there's a whole class of people in Blackmore you could identify these firms. If you if you have if someone has a deal in a space, they'll go smaller all day long. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times people average down they overpay on the front end knowing they can try to do smaller add-ons mm -hmm. um so if somebody brought me a company that was an mro and wheels brakes and landing gears i'd go as small as made sense because we own something in that sector yeah so if pe firms that are strategic in that space can afford to do that and maybe even set up a separate company and it may or may not 
uh, it, uh, it can be run under an umbrella and not necessarily folded in. And these are all the things, by the way, uh, in being a Blackmore Connects member with the educational aspects of it, the, the uh, educational library, the webinars like this, you can get educated and save yourself years of mistakes. We have made the mistakes. We've codified this information, or I should say the Blackmore Connects group uh, has done that. And it's all available, just like any member association, to give you a leg up in a very, very opaque world. Uh, talk ab again, a lot of executives don't understand about how, why uh, deals of a certain EBITDA uh, are too uh, small to afford by a private equity. Talk about the expenses that go into a deal uh, it, that impacts. Yeah, yeah the, the costs of, of buying a company have become uh, significant uh, over the past 10 years. And the cost of the diligence is really unrelated to the size of the EBITDA. Matter of fact, sometimes smaller ones uh, are more expensive because they don't have the infrastructure to provide the data that you need. So as a good example, you know, you know, usually legal diligence uh, is going to be north of 100,000 on the low end. Uh, you know, 100 would be low. Um, and you've got quality of earnings accounting. You've got environmental. You've got uh, business diligence, maybe marketing. You know, all in, you're looking at typically 250 to $500,000. Uh, of diligence, and that's because you know we're we're basically um, you're know, betting even in a small deal you're betting a lot of money that you're not missing things, and we're fiduciaries for money for the banks and everyone. So we've got a series of steps we have to go through regardless of the size, and it just has to we have to make sure it's it's worth it. If the cost of the deal is more than the EBITDA of the company. Um, you know that that gets problematic, uh, unless you know there are examples where people will try to, um, and uh, Gerald will know what I'm referring to, do like five small deals at the same time, and that way can leverage. Uh, but that's you know that's usually the exception. That, that's very true. So I have a few other questions here as we go along. This one from Paul, uh, and I'll take uh, the first answer, and then you could add on to it. How should execs protect themselves from the P from cutting the exec out of the deal? Well, Paul, if you're working with Blackmore, we first of all, we sign an NDA and non circumvent with the executive and we get all of our private equity firms to sign NDAs and non circumvents uh, with us. So that's the way we do it. So you got to have the proper forms uh, to do that. What are your thoughts on that, Chip? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's certainly a good, good question. Um, I think that you, you've got to rely on um, what well, you, you guys would obviously be able to help in this regard. You know, what's the reputation of the uh, PE firm? I mean, it can, find people that are, you know, in their you know common LinkedIn profile and ask them what their experience has been doing with different people. Um, you could do that with several people in the firm and. And you ask around, and then uh, I think you're right. You you step carefully, and you protect yourself. And um, you know, you, I think you just got to go into a relationship with your eyes open. And if if your all your interests are aligned, and you do those things, you know, you'll be you'll be in good shape. That's also why I talked about integrity, because I know that if I were, uh, you know, an executive on the other side, I would be worried about the same thing. And it's, it's, you know, it's my goal to make sure that people are happy working with us. So I, uh, I get a good reputation and anybody that's ever called uh, says good things about working with us. And that's yeah, our it's, mission. It's really, uh, really important. And something that else that comes to mind, Paul and all the other executives, you got to date a lot. How else did you find out who you're going to get married to? Now, some of you got married to the first person that may or may not be so uh, has some uh, worked out for you. But dating a lot, interviewing lots of private equity firms is critical. Being a member of Blackmore Connects up on the website, 
uh, on their Blackmore Connects library. There's dozens and dozens of interviews and panels that we've been doing over the years to give you the ability to compare and contrast and develop specific criteria that you've never been able to do before. In addition, getting on the phone with uh, you know, 50, 100 P firms and learning about their investment criteria, learning the questions to ask, that's all part of the training and development that the Blackmore Connects group does to prepare you for choosing the right PE firm. Let's go to uh, another exec here, Brian. Um, for an exec that has dri driven successful turnarounds through strategy and growth versus financial engineering, and by the way, uh, Br uh, Brian, financial engineering is pretty much dead at this point. It's just not enough juice. And everyone else has figured it out. So as a competitive advantage, it has disappeared. We'll hear from Chip on that. So uh, versus financial engineering across several different manufacturing industries, how do I best uh, to shape the ability to interest a PE firm uh, like Weinberg? Um, well, first of all, I do, I, I do think financial engineering is uh, is dead. I mean, I was never a believer in it, even at its heyday. That just wasn't our our thesis. I thought that could produce uh, short term term gains, and it's also a little bit like rolling the dice. But I, I, I guess um, in terms of the question, I think it's just it's demonstrating the track record that that you just indicated, and um, and then having the thesis or the, the potential target such that there's a way to put it to use. So, I mean, to, to Gerald's point, I get a lot of resumes of people that look like they've got a pretty good track record, but unless there's something going on behind it, either movement towards a company or something I can act on, all I've got is a resume then with, and I'm still out looking for deals. And the, and the, the um, there's, there's nothing wrong with a, a resume other than the fact that uh, I can't do anything with it unless I have a company to put it with. <laughs> so, and right right now, all the ones I own have executives in them. So uh, it's it's about the, the demonstrating part is is just part of the resume. The more important piece is having a strategy and a company to put it to use towards. And that's so uh, that's Gerald's really point. great, actionable, right? So we need a strategy can lead you to think about deal flow that's coming across your desk and go, whoa, that's something Brian just talked about. Let's get to work and see what he has to say and building up that momentum of it. So, yeah, you know, Brian and all the executives here, you got to bring something to the table. These lower middle market, you know, uh, 3 million to about 15 million EBITDA investors such as Chips Group, are so lean, they don't have the cycles. What they rejoice in is executives who are coming there, who know how hard it is, and bringing something to the table to open the conversation. It's a deal thesis. That is, what trends are going on? And then given those trends, how would you capture the value through acquisition? What would an acquisition look like? And we're not saying that you have to know a target, but if you're working with Black Market Connects, they can help build out the funnel list. And you can say, here's some of the, uh, what, what I think we should start acquiring. Here's the general characteristics. Uh, Chip can then go to his bankers and go, listen, I know you guys see these kind of deals. I'm working with an executive. We have an investment thesis. I'm behind it bring us your opportunities. They can reach out to their network and it gives them a reason to do that. They don't have time otherwise. Chip, commentary? Um, well, I, I, that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, I, we have a very full plate of, of different things. And a lot of what I have to do every day is prioritize all the things that are in front of me and say, you know, of these 10 things, which ones uh, look like they're actionable, that I can win them, uh, that we have a good thesis and strategy. So if I have 10 deals in my inbox and, um, you know, they, they, 
let's say that they all look about equal, I've got to I've got to decide and figure out where I'm going to move. And uh, you know what you said is if if somebody comes as an executive with a track record and with a thesis of of something that's actionable, that usually moves up to the top of the list. So there you go. You know, once again, you know, what are the ways to get into private equity and land a role? A deal is always number one. But most of us who are just waking up day to day and go, I want to get in private equity, our first response is I don't have one. And you hope that a private equity firm is going to bring one to you. Well, if you're not bringing something to the table, private equity firms are so used to everyone, give me a company, I'll do great for you, blah, blah, blah. They do the sell job. It is a turnoff. So at the very least, get to work on building a deal thesis. You can, uh, if you schedule a meeting, if you're, if you have the P&L that I, a 50 plus million history of EBITDA, you've been a, a CFO slash COO slash CEO or general manager, We'll work with you to get started on that whole process. You can get started on the purple squirrel process and start honing your ability to be a valuable asset to private equity firms, family offices in the low uh, in the lower middle market and and start your outreach, start coming to conferences, start building in relationships. Private equity firms we've established here. Once again, they do need you. However, they need partners. They don't need another mouth to feed. They don't need someone who's going to go, give me, give me, give me. They're so used to it. And frankly, their job is already difficult trying to find a good deal in which they're giving returns to their LPs. Remember, the LPs get paid before they do. So it, it is and it, it is thankless job until... There's an exit, and then everyone cheers if it's been a great exit. But you want to become a valuable partner. Blackmore Connects, coming to the conferences, meeting folks like Chip and his firm is your pathway to the future. And yes, it is pay to play. We all pay to play. We go to uh, ACG meetings and other types of meetings because in private equity, this is the way it's done. It's hard a chip doesn't have time to go travel around the comp uh, country and meet executives. It's either that or forgo deals. So you want to go to where they are, ACG, Blackmore Connects, and maybe there's iGlobal and a few other uh, Partner Connects types uh, of events. I think, you know, I'm biased towards uh, Blackmore Partners. You can wait for recruiters to call, but in the private equity world, they're just not that big and it's getting less. You can hire your own recruiter, very expensive, but still worth it. Or you attend networking events. It is going to cost and Blackmore Connects does it the best. Chip, any uh, any last minute messages here as we wrap up? Um, uh, just that when you alluded to uh, ACG events, which I do attend also, um, you know, there is a big difference between what you do and what they do. When I go to those ACG events, and I go, you know, maybe to uh, three to five of them per year, you know, it's much more of a mob scene. It's not as direct. I tend not to meet executives. It's usually investment bankers. Um, and, you know, it's not always easy even to find them. It serves a purpose, but uh, that's why, you know, going to your conference is great. I really do get... Uh, to sit one on one with people with uh, direct deals versus, um, you know, the, the auctioned variety. Well, really great. Uh, I do want to say our next conference is coming up April 11th, and uh, one of Chip's colleagues will be at that. Who's going to be from your group uh, at the April 11th in Chicago, 11:30 to 6:30? Yeah, Nick Leiby will be there. Uh, he's got a long experience uh, in private equity and. Uh, he will be set to uh, represent us. Great. Well, thank you for your time and attention, everyone. Uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you at one of our Blackmore Connects. If you're interested, just send me an email and uh, I'll introduce you to Nathan Collins, the director. Or if you have any other questions about doing deal thesis and coaching and development, 
we're happy to schedule a short call to get you started on the path to private equity. That's it. We'll be ending the broadcast. Thanks, everybody.